Panama. 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 Panama is a land of opportunity. But here, what a good spy really needs is a spy of his own. He's smart, great contacts, and no agenda. He's getting all the information he could ever use. <laughs> Welcome to Counter. This is the Panama Papers episode. It's going to be a very long episode, so you might want to get something to drink, maybe a bag of chips, a lot of videos, a lot of analysis. So let's get down to it. Now this all starts in early 2015. A German newspaper uh, called Süddeutsche Zeitung had a contact with a confidential source claiming to have a large collection of data from a Panamanian law firm known as Mossack Fonseca. The confidential source, known as John Doe, released around 11.5 million documents to the German newspaper. That's over two terabytes of data, dating from 1970 to, to late 2015. Upon receiving this data, Süddeutsche Zeitung contacted the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and from there, they filtered and selectively disseminated a lot of the information to other international and local publications. Now, the whole research effort took around about a year, and they met uh, very secludedly in various locations around the world. I believe they met in Norway and also in Washington, D.C. Now... That's all well and good, and it's a big leak and a lot of information, but there's issues with this information. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered, and a lot of doubts raised by these accusations. One of the problems I see with the leak are the sources. Now, naturally, when you're looking at any kind of information, you always want to find that it's a reliable source, that at least the publication has some degree of credibility providing that nature of a story. In other words, that you can trust your source. Now, Süddeutsche Zeitung is a Munich paper. Uh, it's known as the largest national subscription daily paper in Germany. It was one of the first papers to receive a license by the U.S. military after the fall of Germany. And uh, that, you know, that's a little shady, let's say, because that means that implies that the, the paper has a history of close ties with the U.S. government. At the same time, there are reports German media continues to gain support from the U.S. State Department and more specifically the CIA. Well, I, I've been a journalist for about 25 years and I was educated to lie, to betray and uh, not to tell the truth to the public. Uh, I was supported by the Central Intelligence Agency, by the CIA. At the same time, you also have to look at the fact that there was another leak prior to this one, a smaller leak that came, guess from where? Mossack Fonseca. So it's the exact same location. So this is starting to smell a little bit more like the boy who cried wolf. You know, the first leak came in didn't take so they want a bigger leak more right because maybe this won't gain some traction the problem of course is the fact that if you look at the first leak the first leak wasn't really done by a newspaper the first leak was done by the german government after they bought the information from a source who previously tried to sell that same information to the u.s and the british so again there are questions on the source. Someone was selling information the first time and then they decided to give it away for free. 
it raises a lot of questions, especially when you put into consideration the close ties the Americans, and more specifically American intelligence, has with Germany. Next up is the other organization that they decided to share all their information with, and these are the people who are basically monopolizing all the information, an association called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. This is an entity that is managed by the Center for Public Integrity. The problem with these organizations is that they have a clear Western perspective and they support liberal agendas. The Washington Post have criticized them as being a campaign finance lobby and they were accused by Politico for breaking the law in violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They have in the past coordinated the release of information with Greenpeace. They were funded by Pew Research to support uh, anti-phishing agendas. And in 2002, they published a report on tobacco that was both funded and promoted by an anti-smoking NGO, Tobacco Free Kids. Sources can be seen in the description. At the same time, This organization is funded by a wide array of groups, including George Soros' Open Society Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Pew Charitable Trust, the Rockefeller Family Fund, and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So again, there's a lot of lines being drawn, and they're not leading to anywhere that you would call necessarily credible. Now, what are the outcome of these leaks? What Ultimately, what is a story that came out after a year of research, hundreds of journalists, and various countries' involvement? There are about 216,000 offshore companies mentioned in the leak. Um, all the information is controlled by the ICIJ and also by the German newspaper. They determine who's found guilty and who's not, who's worth reporting and who is not. Now, make no mistake. This is, on paper, the largest leak in history, larger than Cablegate, the offshore leaks, Lux leaks, and the Swiss leaks. However, no one can officially verify it because the information is not public. 400 journalists from 107 media organizations in 80 countries are right now typing and researching away to the scraps the ICIJ has given them. Limited to flashing lights, on only small corners of a story. So considering what they've had to do for the past year, what do they have? What is the result? There have been some notable names uh, within the documents, very few and far between, but there's one, let's say one commonality between all the people mentioned is that they're very old and they're very foreign. Panama Papers point to people with ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin and other global leaders. Yes, perfect villain, Vladimir Putin. The headlines, moreover, front page headlines, looked almost entirely the same. Pointing figures at the Russian president, despite him not even being mentioned directly on the leaked documents. Now, speaking of the names mentioned on that list, it includes presidents of Argentina, Mauricio Macri, the uh, Sheikh of the United Arab Emirates, Al Nahayan, the King of Saudi Arabia, King Salman, the Um, Prime Minister of Iceland, Gunlaxon, the um, Emir of Qatar, Hamad bin Khalaf al Thani, uh, as well as the Spanish royal family, uh, even the father of one of the biggest fighters against tax evasion, UK Prime Minister Donald Cameron, uh, David Cameron, sorry, and uh, the Ukrainian president, several football officials, including the former UEFA president, Michel Platini, um, arguably one of the best footballers in the world, Lionel Messi from Barcelona is on the list, as well as the kung fu fighting Jackie Chan, the famous actor. At the same time, no major American figures can be seen. Now take into account this is from the 1970s up until last year, and not many Americans have been very found. They have some examples of a few people who have been convicted of tax fraud, but if you look at the individuals mentioned, one, those, the, those people are already in jail. So clearly this tax evasion system didn't work for them. And, and two, um, they're hardly what you would call recognizable key American figures. They're very small time, small time, tiny fish. Now, a lot of critics have mentioned the absence of Americans. Now, one thing you have to take into account is this. Sometimes 
the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. In other words, just because you don't see any Americans listed on the paper doesn't mean the Americans aren't involved. Or the British. There are some problems with race. And ultimately the issue is the clear agenda being promoted by the article. This is an echo chamber engineered by the ICIJ. Remember that just because 400 journalists are screaming fire, could all be staring at a candle. Concern for many people who thought about the way in which capitalism has developed, globalization developed over the last few years, that there would be large amounts of money slushing around the international system. No laundering. better than I do. That's not going to stop people evading or avoiding No, 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 absolutely not. And therefore, well, what you need is international agreements and much better enforcement. I must tell you something. I had, I'm probably one of the first Russian businessmen in Britain in the 90s. And our Russian businessmen were finding out about offshore accounts in the night end of the 90s, while your lot has been polishing its offshore skills for about 150 years. So you think that when we scratch the surface of Panama, it'll all be legal? I don't think it will all be legal, because Panama is, is a known territory controlled by the CIA very closely. I don't understand who actually opens offshore accounts in Panama. I mean, it's like going to Langley and say, would you keep my money? We turn to Gerard Ryle, the director of the ICIJ. Explain to us what these folks are doing in these dealings and what's illegal about it. Well, a lot of what happens in the offshore world is actually legal. But where you have secrecy, which is exactly what the offshore world provides, then you have the potential for wrongdoing. Often, secrecy can be another word for privacy. But it goes deeper than that. And this is... This is really where I think, in this story, I think I hit some pay dirt. Let's take a trip to 2013. The G20 summit is wrapping up, and one of the outcomes is the creation of treaties to chase tax evaders. UK, France, and Germany are backing a new initiative set to crack down on multinational firms evading taxes. The plan was discussed Saturday on the sidelines of the Group of 20 summit in Moscow. Now, we all want international businesses located in our countries and doing business in our countries and employing people in our countries. A lot of people speculated that this was one of the first steps to establishing some type of major international uh, tax grid, but it, it, it kind of fizzled out because most of the people at the time, remember this is 2013, were focused on the Syrian civil war and whatever sanctions the G20 were going to do uh, in support of it. But let's move forward. The Obama administration with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton both pushed for a free trade agreement with Panama. One of our top goals is to complete free trade agreements with Colombia and Panama. Now, I'm not uh, talking out of school when I say that free trade agreements always raise hard questions. And they spark a lot of healthy debate in our country. But today, I'm happy to report we are making great progress on both agreements. We have worked with our Panamanian and Colombian partners to address key concerns and forge broader bipartisan support in the Congress, just as we did with the South Korean free trade agreement. Panama passed important new laws on labor rights and tax transparency. This agreement was signed even with the express opposition of certain critics, including uh, 2016 Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. Let me say a word about the Panama Free Trade Agreement. Now, Panama is a very small country. Its entire uh, annual economic output is only $26.7 billion a year, or about two-tenths of 1% of the American economy. So I think no one is going to legitimately stand up here and say that trading with such a small country uh, is going to significantly increase American jobs. Then why would we? Why would we be considering a trade agreement with Panama? What's going on there? Well, it turns out, Mr. President, that Panama is a world leader when it comes to allowing wealthy Americans and large corporations to evade U.S. taxes by stashing their cash in offshore tax havens. And the Panama Free Trade Agreement would make this bad situation much worse. Uh, as I'm a member of the Budget Committee, as you are, Mr. President, and we have heard testimony time and time again that our country is losing up to $100 billion every year 
as corporations stash their money in postal addresses in the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and in Panama. And this trade agreement makes that situation even worse. According to Citizens for Tax Justice, quote, a tax haven has one of three characteristics. It has no income tax or a very low rate income tax. It has bank secrecy laws, and it has a history of non-cooperation with other countries on exchanging information about tax matters. Panama has all three of those. Now that the cat's out of the bag, the Obama administration comes out and they said, well, we're always trying to push for tax transparency. That's been one of our main goals to push for this thing, even though they signed the free trade agreement with Panama, a free trade agreement that allowed this type of behavior to continue. The Treasury Department has taken new action to prevent more corporations from taking advantage of one of the most insidious tax loopholes out there and fleeing the country just to get out of paying their taxes. Uh, this got some attention in the business press yesterday, but uh, I wanted to make sure that we highlighted the importance of Treasury's action and why it did what it did. Uh, this directly goes at what's called corporate inversions. But they effectively renounce their citizenship. They declare that they're based somewhere else, thereby getting all the rewards of being an American company without fulfilling the responsibilities to pay their taxes the way everybody else is supposed to pay them. When companies exploit loopholes like this, it makes it harder to invest in the things that are going to keep uh, America's economy going strong for future generations. It sticks the rest of us with the tab, and it makes hardworking Americans feel like the deck is stacked against them. So this is something that I've been pushing for a long time. Since I became president, we've made our tax code fair. And we've taken steps to make sure our tax laws are actually enforced, including leading efforts to crack down on offshore evasion. In the news over the last couple of days, uh, we've had another reminder uh, in this big dump of data coming out of Panama that tax avoidance is a big global problem. It's not unique to other countries because, frankly, there are folks here in America who are taking advantage of the same stuff. A lot of it's legal. But that's exactly the problem. Clear hypocrisy from the Obama administration, and at the same time, how convenient that a day or two days before, they release new revisions to the IRS tax code that would allow such manipulation and tax evasion to be clearly detected by authorities. So again, you have this convenient story being pushed by the administration that aligns itself with the Panama Papers. So there's ultimately a direct conflict with this establishment narrative. However, when you look hard at the data, you find that the US and England are some of the largest tax havens in the world. The Panama Papers themselves reflect this to a certain extent, as Nevada is listed as one directly. It's funny when you look at the documents when you're reading all these files, because they'll list the countries individually. So they'll put Panama as a country. You know, they'll put Bermuda as a country, but they'll put Nevada like it's its own rogue state, like it's not a part of America. So, ultimately, it's something that needs to be investigated. So what is the conclusion of this article? What is ultimately the, the end game of the Panama Papers, the 11.5 million page stack that sits on all our desks, or at least for the time being the desk of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. That's the, uh, that's the trillion dollar question, isn't it? Because based on the figures that we have, there's around 200, uh, not sorry, not 200. There's two trillion dollars just moving outside. Ultimately, the conclusion is that this is a cash grab. This is trying to get public support to push for international tax legislation that would allow these tax havens not to exist. This deals with a greater issue because corporate inversions, to tell you the truth, have existed for a while. Dummy corporations have existed for a while. There's a reason why the government at this point in time is clamoring down, and maybe I'll do a video about that. But this raises a bigger issue, 
And a lot of it has to do with these new economic powerhouses that are coming in. And to tell you the truth is, there's too many kids at the pool. If you understand what I'm saying, in, in a monetary sense, there's too many kids in the pool. There's not enough water to keep those kids afloat. But I think that's enough for this episode. So we'll see where this goes. I might do another video following up talking about bigger issues, but I'll leave it with this. I'll end this video. I got two videos, two clips that I think are very relevant to this issue. Um, and I think you should ultimately check it out. But at the end, I want to I want to know what you guys think. I want to know what are your opinions about this situation? What are your opinions about the Panama Papers? Do you think they're credible? Do you think this is entirely engineered by Western intelligence agencies? Do you think there's some kind of hidden agenda? Or do you believe it? You know, Do you think that this is all real? That Mossack Fonseca never fixed their security regardless of the fact that they've had multiple leaks in the past? And that you know the fact that all the information is not revealed to the public is completely fine. Just... If you feel that way or you agree or disagree, I want to know. I want to know. I want to have the dialogue with you. I want to know what you guys think. Um, next video, I don't know. I think I might just do a puff piece, talk about movies or something. So this has been Counter, and you have been watching. Inversions, right? You've said this is a serious problem. A tremendous problem. Okay, so... You've also argued that bankruptcy laws, you've taken advantage of the bankruptcy laws. I have. Corporations have done that. It's, for, it's within many, the law. Many, people. You right. take advantage. How, is, how are inversions different from taking advantage of the bankruptcy laws? Well, the this is legal. Right. This sure. is companies trying to benefit sure. their shareholders. How is it different? Sure. Much different in this way. You can stop it so easily. There's two and a half trillion dollars out there. At least it could be four, it could be five, but two and a half trillion dollars that they know of. This is money that wants to come back to this country. The corporations want to bring back. They can't bring it back in because of the tax laws. They're so prohibitive, so bad, and so complicated. So they can't bring it. So now what's happening is companies are leaving our country. And you're reading about it. You're seeing Pfizer. You're seeing some. They're leaving our country and thinking about massive numbers of companies are thinking about leaving to go out and get that money. Also, to get a better tax deal. So that's a lot different. So when you're saying when you're saying it's a serious problem, what you're saying is the law is the problem, not the company's behavior. It's not bad what Pfizer is doing. No, it's and there's no way you can stop it, really, other than lowering the taxes, because right now, John, it's prohibitive to bring that money in. They'd have to pay so much, it'd have to be fools to bring it in. I used to think Greece was the capital of tax evasion and avoidance. Uh, how are you viewing it tonight? Well, firstly, I'm exceptionally pleased that there are many uh, of those who have enjoyed not so much uh, tax evasion but tax immunity, who are having sleepless nights. <laughs> it's a, a wonderful whiff of transparency, even though it may be short-lived, uh, fills me with joy. But at the same time, it fills me with worry that uh, we are focusing too much on a fake sense of surprise. Uh, the only thing that's surprising is that we, we get surprised by this. And we also uh, zoom too much into Panama, the idea of some small island in the Caribbean, when uh, here in the middle of Europe we have a beggar thy, thy neighbor policy of taxation. Uh, st states like Ireland, indeed London, are competing unfairly with uh, other parts of Europe. Uh, we try to steal economic uh, value from one another. We have a president mm. of the European Commission who was running a tax haven in the center of Europe. Um, well, you see, of course, <laughs> we're not members of the Euro, and that's the biggest No, but element. you're members of the European Union, and you are uh, w uh, as one with us in this uh, race to the bottom, in the beggar thy neighbor policies on tax. Mm. Uh, it's about time we harmonize taxes, especially if we want to have a single market. No, but, but you see, but, the, but there's yeah. another point here. A lot of people don't like the way governments spend taxpayers' money. A lot of this money is spent on wars, on vanity projects. It's wasted. So there is a certain protest in this, all of this, because people are saying, why should I give that well, money? Uh, Alexander, with respect, no, with respect, no, 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 with respect, saying... surely, what, what a lot of people worry about is what did the Russians do in the 1990s when they started shipping these vast quantities of what belonged to Russia 
out of the country into the well, city of London. Well, let me tell you what happened. Thereby let perverting much of I what was going on that. here. I witnessed that. The, the problem was that Western bankers and big consultancies came to Russia and said to these oligarchs, you know what, you can hide your money in the West. And they helped them to do that. The, the, the notion that since 2008, 2009, we have really strengthened regulation uh, is rather vacuous. We have done nothing more than cosmetic changes in order to hide the reality that the political system in, throughout Europe, not just in Britain, this is not a party political point, yeah, sure. has utterly and miserably failed. And um, there's nobody you meet that doesn't believe the crisis will dawn again and we'll have another crash. Russians invest money into Britain because it's not in the euro. You must understand that. You are a victim of your own success. Yes. If you were in the Eurozone, you would see nothing of it. 